Antonio. Good day, Chair. Look on. At a horn. Are a sabon hour to carry cold. Give my tat. An antio nagaria mount. I am a Maya, a Uta head wave, a we must just all keep safe um, yeah, and protect ourselves. What can we do? So this thing will be our way of life uh, until when? Hey. Are it, are it. Uh, I was going to help you know, really, she was going to help you know, Honorable Mabileta and uh, Dr. George, can you call members of your political parties to join so that we can start? Okay. We'll do, Chair. Dr. George, can you call some of your members to come in so that we can start with uh, your bill here? Yeah? I will do what I can, Chair. Thank you. Okay.
Alan Tebugo, it looks like now, are we five? I see Honorable Louis, Honorable Mrolong have joined. Uh, yes, Chair, and uh, Ms. Abraham also joined the current the session. Um, are we six? Uh, yes, it's six. Yes, and then the only apology is the voter review. Okay. Let's start. Uh, Noxi. Chair. Uh, thanks for holding the fort yesterday. Yes, Chair. The Chair is a, is a leader in this province. What can I do? Pleasure, Chair. Hey, <laughs> I'm busy now by election. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's start. It's quite a very tight schedule. Uh, welcome, uh, honorable members of the committee. Uh, welcome, uh, treasurer. Uh, welcome, uh, support staff from parliament, uh, PBO, uh, and also our stakeholders. Uh, the, the meeting is officially open, and then uh, apologies. You said it's honorable vessels and who else? That's the only apology, Chair. That's the only apology. Uh, and then uh, today is about the uh, public hearings on the patient's fund, patient funds amendment bill. Uh, stakeholders, you are welcome. Uh, National Treasurer will have 15 minutes, Cosato 15 minutes, Assista 15 minutes, uh, IRFA uh, 15 minutes, Saika 15 minutes. Then discussion will be one hour, responses 30 minutes, closure. Uh, so I would like, uh, I would request stakeholders to be very strict when it comes to keeping time. Our schedule is very tight as uh, spontaneous to what we are doing now. We also have uh, mini plenaries. So hence you find members uh, uh, divided between uh, uh, committees and plenaries. So the meeting is officially open. Uh, Treasury, over to you, strictly 15 minutes. Uh, who's briefing us, uh, Comrade Momo, over to him. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair, and uh, morning to honorable colleagues uh, and everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, Chair, I've, uh, I don't know if the slides are coming on. Um, Ellen, are you putting it up? Um, so Chair, we've provided a brief note um, I've got quite a large team with me. I don't even know all of who, who are here, but I know at least Olauzi Machani is here, Avina Tela, Basil Maseko, Janine Bedner, Briosi, and there's colleagues from the FISCA who are also present, who have uh, uh, worked with us to prepare this presentation. Chair, I think, oh, you know, the so key... Komlo, Momo, uh, yeah. now it's, it's quarter past nine. Of yeah. course, we should have started at uh, nine o'clock. So exactly half past, uh, I will plead that uh, you should be done. So just speak to, to the slides uh, so that uh, we try to save the 15 minutes that we have lost while waiting for members. Uh, back to you. Sure, thank you, Chair. So Chair, if you, I, I, I just want to start off briefly by saying, if you get to the next slides, um, you can move quite fast, Ellen that you know, retirement reform has been a major project for the Treasury from 2011, 2012. And the primary aim was to encourage household savings um, and to get individuals to be less vulnerable to poverty. Uh, as you know, and I've put the figures up, South Africans don't save a lot in, in, in 2020, according to the quarterly bulletin this in March, uh, our total savings is 14.6% of GDP. But of that, housing savings is only 2%. And Chair, I should add that the 2% is made up uh, uh, largely of contractual savings. In other words, uh, what people save for their pensions, what's deducted from their uh, um, uh, salary checks. Um, otherwise, we generally don't try, we don't save too much, okay? And, and buying of retirement annuities. Yes, the reason is structural, you know, 
uh, when you have high unemployment, people, uh, your middle class is very small relative to the rest of the population. And of course, behavioral reasons. And that's not a South African phenomenon. All of us, I think, um, most people in the world tend to think about the, the short term. How can I manage today and not tomorrow? So if you looked at our program, it was to fundamentally transform and reform the retirement industry and to make sure that it serves members of funds better. And that included lowering of cost uh, consolidation, getting more preservation because South Africans, even when they save, there are too many loopholes. Uh, you resign from work, you cash your entire amount. Uh, the, we also had different treatment across funds, like for pension funds, provident funds, the tax treatment was different. Uh, and the governance has tended to be very poor in many funds. Uh, it's something that we're working on. And we want to normally encourage uh, annuitization so that people can at least get a monthly income or yearly income after they retire. I should make a point, retirement reform is for the long term. We also talk about non-retirement savings. Next slide, please. Um, so we made some progress on that vision. We've uh, encouraged preservation. We introduced what we call default regulations. We've introduced uh, improvement in governance. Uh, annuitization, in fact, only came into effect this year in March, 1st of March, 2021, because uh, that also got um, uh, uh, you know, into protracted negotiations at NEDLAC because uh, Labour at the time in 2015 when we passed the law had objections, we had to de delay the law and it finally took effect this year. Um, you know, we, we, so annuitization is on the table again. The taxation uh, harmonization has taken place. Um, I'll move on, I'll, given the time, I'm not going to go through everything. Um, and um, sorry, this just refers to the different tax treatments that were there and what we implemented. Move on. Um, but, uh, and some of these reforms, Chair, are ongoing. And, and if you looked at the, the budget this year and the MTBPS last year, basically our biggest issue is still we don't have enough coverage, particularly of people who don't have stable jobs whatever we mean by stable jobs, you know, people who move from one employer to another on contract and so on. Those of us who have one employer, our salaries get deducted, but we quite, uh, uh, you know, we don't make up the entire stock of those of, of, of the country. Certainly we are a minority. Um, so expanding coverage through what's called auto enrollment, uh, prioritizing preservation, because this is the biggest challenge we face, and then to consolidate, consolidate, consolidate. We had over 13,000 funds when we started in 2012. Uh, if I remember the number correctly, it's now uh, something in the three to 5,000, depending on how you count it. But ideally we want to bring them down to 10 or maybe 100 or 200, but uh, really far lower than the numbers that we have today. Improving governance continues to be an issue, especially on, uh, uh, a role of trustees and particularly in umbrella funds where we have big concerns. Reducing costs continues to be a big objective. Um, uh, uh, next slide. Next slide, Alan. I, I think, Chair, I want to point out that retirement reforms form part of the comprehensive social security and retirement reform, which has been in, at NEDLEC for the past few years. Um, uh, there's been a lot of extensive discussions going on. Um, uh, and the whole discussion on early access to retirement savings has been on the agenda. It was raised by Kusatu and some of the unions uh, last year during COVID. Uh, uh, and though the intention has been to have this in place uh, as soon as possible because of COVID, I want to add that there are big challenges that we face and we've still not come across uh, an approach and any approach we have must be linked with mandatory preservation. So we must close all the loopholes there are with preservation. Otherwise you're going to find that uh, 
uh, people will rush to the door to, to, to cash. A, even if you have a limited uh, amount, um, it will have, uh, it can destabilize the system quite significantly. Uh, in fact, it will happen. It, it's not just that it can, in my view, if you look at the international experience elsewhere. We're continuing on consolidation and governance. And we, we also are in the process of amending Regulation 28, which is to enable funds to invest in infrastructure. And I should add, Chair, that you'll see that the more funds are either withdrawn or pledged uh, against a loan, your capacity then to, for funds to invest in infrastructure will also um, uh, be lower. Next slide. Um, Chair, this is just to show that, you know, certainly as government, we've not, uh, we've been very watching clearly on what to do with COVID. We've introduced a whole number of measures, including with regard to retirement contributions and so on. Uh, and, and, and I won't go through these, but these were some of the measures that we introduced. The withdrawal one, as I said, is the most difficult one, which we've not been able to uh, make progress on as yet. Next slide. So, Chair, if you look at this, the bill that's on the table, uh, the pen, um, uh, today, the Pensions Act, uh, Amendment Act, um, if you, it, it seeks to amend Section 19, and uh, it's said to, the intention is to alleviate financial pressure. Um, it also makes claims uh, to motivate the bill, but I should add, Chair, that, you know, we think a lot of these statements cannot be born if you really examine them. Um, and largely there's been no socioeconomic or financial impact study uh, provided to support the bill, which, which the, as you know, when the executive presents bills, we have a CIAS, uh, as we call it CIAS, the socioeconomic impact study. And I think that when you have a bill for retirement, which is for the long term, and where you don't want too many things, uh, changes being made uh, uh, very often, uh, it's, it's, it's problematic to, to, uh, when such a bill serves before parliament. Next slide. So Chair, our concerns with the bill is that, you know, though it says it's for COVID relief, it's not really for COVID relief, it's a more medium term measure rather than a short term measure, which relates to the funding of housing. Yes, it might, bring relief to some households, uh, but uh, largely it's a more medium term measure. And our problem is that uh, even the motivation is not supported by the evidence, both on leverage and on competitive interest rates. Um, and in, at the end of the day, will mean that there'll be less funds available. And Chair, I should add that loading the limit from 75% to 10% or, so, or whatever lower percentage is not going to be a solution. I will show in the rest of the presentation how that still brings risk. So we, as Treasury, we are, uh, and, and though some funds are allowed to do it in terms of their rules, we are actually against having any loans against pension funds because the scope for abuse is high and that's what's already happening. Next slide. Next slide, please, Ellen. Um, so, Chair, our issue is that retirement funds are not easy to use for short-term objectives like withdrawals. To the extent that we look at it, it should be in terms of long-term or, or sometimes for the medium term. And if members are just allowed, if it's unlimited, the savings will, uh, will be withdrawn as we've seen in countries like Chile. We were just speaking to um, uh, uh, colleagues from the World Bank the other day who looked at what happened in Chile, for example, which is all often held up to have a great uh, social security system for a developing country. Um, as I said, discussions are still taking place and we, we are working, once we, we, we have a framework, we will put in place a bill, we were hoping to do it this year. So depending on when we uh, emerge with something, we will certainly uh, bring that to parliament uh, hopefully this year, but uh, uh, possibly early next year, depending on progress that we've made. 
Next slide, please. So Chair, I, I think I'll just given the time, I'll go through this. As it is, I think the point is that we as South Africans, we don't save. And these are all some stats to show you um, uh, um, uh, just how little we save and how even those who have retirement policies actually don't have enough for when they're going to, to retire. And those are the big challenges we face in this area. This measure will actually work the other way, uh, uh, in the opposite direction of where we should be going to try and get more people to save and to save more. Next slide. The bill is also likely to increase indebtedness. Uh, there are issues with the National Credit Act that have also been sorted out. And the uh, major issue we have with the bill is that underlying it, it doesn't, uh, um, it just enables borrowing, but it doesn't explain how it's going to work, how it's going to deal with, for example, the National Credit Act. Um, uh, uh, and effectively, how it's going to deal with indebtedness. Uh, which it could actually make worse in our view. Next slide. Um, so yeah, just to make the point, and, and no underlying details are provided. Obviously it may not be provided in the bill, but neither is it in the motivation. It's not clear to us how it would work and it relies on providing guarantees, which will create substantial contingent liabilities against pension funds. And if a guarantee is called upon, I think Chair must bear in mind that uh, retirement funds are also making long-term investments and uh, uh, to, to try and cash in your long-term investment or investments in infrastructure will be costly for the fund and to all other members who, who, who are there. Next slide. Um, uh, Chair, we go into the issue of, of the bill. It, whilst it deals with Section 19, it doesn't deal with other sections like Section 37A, D. So the bill itself is not comprehensive and it, it, there'll be huge problems with interpretation. Next slide. Um, further, the tax implications are ignored in the bill. If you're going, the, the, the whole approach towards withdrawal taxation will need to be looked at. And for that, you still need a separate bill, a money bill, and not this bill. So this bill can't go alone. It needs to be seen with a suite of measures, like looking at section 37 and also tax proposals. Next slide, Chief. I have later, uh, more time later, I can explain these. Uh, um, yeah, next slide. Uh, I, I think I'll focus on our issue of preservation. You can move towards the end, the last slide, just given the time. Um, uh, next slide. So Chair, to conclude, the bill is not supported by Treasury because we believe it brings great risk to members of retirement funds and their funds. Allowing loans for housing or anything else, any other loan is not supported. Uh, because it works you know, against the very concept of saving, both in terms from a macro perspective where South Africans don't save. And secondly, um, uh, even if you lower the percentage, that's not a solution. So to say that, that it, the percentage is too high, which it is, is not, it's not gonna help to lower the percentage even to 1%. Uh, amending the bill, I think, to deal with section 37, to deal with the tax, uh, implications and to the perverse outcomes. I mean, it, it, it really the, is, is a major piece of work. It's something we actually are doing, but as I said, we need to get the model right and we haven't got the model right or the framework right. And so we would, as Treasury, we, we believe the bill should be rejected and, and Parliament should rather wait for us to produce a consensus bill, which we're working with NEDLEC uh, partners. And the priority though, I think in terms of retirement reform is still about coverage, consolidation, preservation, governance, lowering costs and reform, continuing to reform the annuity market. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mumuniot, for your presentation from Treasury. Uh, let's move to the next uh, item, uh, stakeholders.
Kosato, you have got 15 minutes. Uh, Comrade Momo took two minutes of your time. So you will present from now until 13 minutes to 10. Uh, okay. Comrade uh, uh, Matthews, you are used to this platform. So over <laughs> to you. You are welcome. No, no, you, are, you are almost part of us, <laughs> even last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, thanks very much, Comrade Chen, and good luck uh, with the by-elections today. Um, no, no, uh, thanks, Comrade Chen, members and colleagues from Treasury and other colleagues um, for giving Kosato a chance to give our submission. I'll try to be time efficient as well. Um, so I think let's just say from an introductory perspective, uh, Chair members, um, you know, Kosato has got almost 2 million members across almost every sector of the economy. And often these are the sole source of support financially for the huge army of unemployed people in this country. So I think we want to, as, a, as an outcome, welcome this bill. We think it's progressive, it's a necessary step forward. Uh, we also believe, uh, honorable chair members and colleagues, that it's a positive response to the call the COSATO made last year to, to government um, to allow workers access to limited access to their pension funds when needed. Uh, but we do agree with, you know, Comrade Momo from Treasury and colleagues but the bill requires significant amendments to address some weaknesses, but also to strengthen it. But we think, Comrade Chair, that such a bill can help many workers and the families um, facing the worst economic crisis in a century. Um, Chair, I think members would know that millions of workers in South Africa have lost their wages and their jobs during this pandemic and recession. Uh, many will also continue to lose wages going forward as companies struggle to stay afloat, as even SOEs struggle to stay afloat. Um, but we have a situation, Chair, a bit of an anomaly in the law that a worker who loses their job can access their pension funds to survive, which is correct. But a worker who loses their wages or experiences se severe financial distress, legally they're denied access to the savings. And this creates a huge problem because they have funds, but they're not able to access it to take care of the family. The unintended consequence of this, Comrade Chair, is that it actually perversely incentivizes workers to resign from very scarce jobs to cash out their pension funds. And this, this is really the worst of both scenarios because one, it depletes these pension funds and then leaves workers with nothing left when they retire. But also from a chair, it, it worsens workers' financial crisis because they are now unemployed. And we know that once you lose a job in South Africa with an unemployment rate of 40%, it can easily take you two years, if not longer to find new work. So I think we need to find the correct balance. I think we must bear in mind that pensions are worker savings. I um, mean, workers who lose, who lose the wages or experience severe distress financially should be allowed some limited access to a portion of the pension funds, not the entire funds. Um, because we do agree with Treasury that we need to try to incentivize savings as much as possible because they have another crisis in that front. So Comrade Chair, we had written to Treasury last year, May, in the midst of the pandemic asking to allow workers some access to their pensions because many workers simply went home with no money. There was huge problems with the UFTs, et cetera. And we'd also raised this during the, the various budget hearings in parliament last year and this year. So a few aspects of the bill and we appreciate the very short bill. Um, I think, you know, we're, we appreciate the loan provisions in the bill. Um, it does build upon the existing home loan provisions already provided for in the Pensions Funds Act. Um, but I think, Chair, we also want to say as we need, as Kosato, we need to have a, a pragmatic, a prudent, a balanced approach. Um, so whilst we do need to allow workers to access parts of the funds, limits are needed. Um, we cannot afford to go to the other extreme of allowing complete depletion of the pension funds uh, because it will cause chaos. It will cause a run on pension funds that will have an impact upon where they invested, et cetera. And many of these funds wouldn't be able to release all cash all at once. So we need to get the right balance. And we also don't want a situation chair where we already have only about 6% of workers being able to afford to retire when they reach retirement age. So we need to get the right balance. So chair, I think the first proposal we have is that the 75% limit is just simply too high. It needs to be reduced to an amount that does provide meaningful relief. Um, so, you know, an amount of 1% wouldn't provide meaningful relief. Uh, but we think we need to find a meaningful relief amount, but also that we do it in a way which doesn't deplete the pension funds, nor disrupt where they invested in, et cetera. Um, Chair, so I think also one proposal, and we're open to compromise and engagement on it, is that reduce the 75% limit on what 
on loans or withdrawals to a more reasonable amount, a sustainable amount of either 30% or up to 30,000 Rand. Chair, the other issue is that we want to raise is that, <clears throat> so the bill proposes to allow workers to take loans um, using the pension as surety. But I think if you look at the national credit uh, reports, most workers cannot afford to incur more debt. Uh, most workers struggle to repay loans, especially now that they have lost wages or they're not seeing wage increases, et cetera. So we think we need to allow workers a choice between a loan or a simple withdrawal. Um, so a new provision would be needed to let workers who lose wages or experience severe financial hardships um, to withdraw funds and the pensions and that they, they do not need to repay it. So simple withdrawal. So we think that you, we could look at putting in place some incentives to encourage workers to repay these withdrawn funds to the pensions when they can afford to do so, when they're back on their feet. Um, Chair, I think we do need to have further discussion <clears throat> between ourselves, Parliament, Treasury, uh, colleagues in the industry about limits that need to be set for the amounts or percentages and how often you could allow such withdrawals to take place because it can't be like an ATM machine where you can go anytime. There should be certain limitations on how often you can do it um, for the same principles of not depleting. Um, we think, Chair, that the withdrawals should be contingent upon replacing lost income so a worker could show a salary slip which shows the lost wages or no wages, or workers experiencing severe financial distress. And again, they could provide bank statements to provide evidence of that. So we think chairs proposal is to insert provisions for workers to be able to withdraw funds in the pension funds um, without being required to pay them, as well as to provide some sort of evidence that they've lost wages or are experiencing huge financial distress. Chair, on the taxation issue, um, and we appreciate that you know pension funds and so on are tax um, exempt, but I think in this case when workers are really struggling, um, we need to to provide some sort of tax exemption provision for them, for these loans or withdrawals. Um, we don't think there should be a situation where government, in in essence, would profit um, from the very painful miseries many workers are facing. Um, workers are not in the majority wanting to withdraw because they want to be reckless and go on holiday. Is simply because they don't have money to buy food for the families or buy electricity, pay for transport for the kids to get to school. Um, and these are funds that belong to workers and they're often very meager amounts. So they shouldn't be depleted by hectic tax penalties. So we think Chair, there's a need for provision providing for, for such loans and withdrawals not to be subject to tax deductions, but perhaps to be fair to treasury um, and to government, you could say the first amounts wouldn't be taxed deducted, so you provide protection for the poor, but amounts above a certain limit could be um, facing some tax tax provisions to get a right balance. Chair, in terms of the, the way forward, I think we want to, in principle, as Kosato, welcome the bill. Um, we believe it is going to help workers and families who have experienced severe wage losses or severe financial distress just to survive, to recover. But we do agree with Treasury, it needs to be handled delicacy and care um, because you can't afford to deplete the pension funds. We think the 75% limit should be reduced to a prudent level of 30% or 30,000 um, rand. And workers should be allowed the right to choose between loans and withdrawals. <clears throat> Chair, we have held, I think, constructive engagements with colleagues in Treasury who initially were not keen on this idea, but I think later kind of came around and, and did appreciate the, the, the proposal. So we do appreciate the kind of the support for the objectives um, the Treasury has kind of, you know, supports. I think this is why as Kosato Chair, we did welcome the, the Minister of Finance, uh, Comrade Mboweni's announcement in the MTPPS in October last year, committing to providing or to ensuring a bill um, is tabled in Parliament in 2021. We are, we are disappointed that this hasn't happened yet, Chair, and we think this will really place our initial implementation target date of 1 October 2021 in, in real jeopardy. Um, but look, Chair, we have had further engagements, positive engagement with Treasury. Um, and I think as Comrade Momo has said, the DDG, um, they are committed to tabling a bill to this effect in Parliament. We would really want to plead that this happens um, by November this year. And so we do want to appreciate as Kosato, Treasury's committed or continued commitment to this proposals. Um, but I think, Chair, we also want to say that this matter can't drag on forever. 
Um, because what you have on the ground is an increasing numbers of workers will simply resign from their jobs and cash out the entire pensions, which is the worst of both scenarios. Chair, as Cosato, we're not concerned whether this is addressed in a private member's bill, which is enhanced, further strengthened, or a treasury bill. Um, but for us, the point is for such a bill to be prioritized, to be passed into law by parliament and then to be implemented by government and industry. So we want to welcome the objectives of the bill chair. Um, we think it's in line with our broad proposals. We are ready to engage um, on the bill and how to strengthen it, how to address the, the gaps, the weaknesses. Um, we'd want to plead that all of us, parliament, treasury, um, across political lines, labor, business supports the objectives of the bill. But I think we'd also want to plead chair for parliament to give some space for further engagements, which are necessary. Uh, between treasury, between industry and labor on this matter. Um, but with these engagements, we need to reach conclusion within the next few months. Um, they should not take forever. It is technically difficult work, but we think it can be done and we sh there shouldn't be too much difficulty finding consensus between all of us on the way forward. So Chair, in conclusion, <clears throat> if this bill isn't the bill to be used, then we would really want to say that Treasury needs to table its own bill in Parliament by the beginning of November this year. So Parliament does have sufficient time to pass it by June next year. So it could come into effect by October next year. So we're, we're proposing from a chair to members that let's not reject this private member's bill. Let's allow for further engagement between government, industry and labor. Um, let's give space to Treasury to draft a bill if needs be. But if Treasury is not able for whatever reason to draft its own bill, by November this year, then we suggest let's proceed to this bill, but with the necessary amendments from Treasury, from business, from Labour, uh, from members of Parliament. But I think in essence, Comrade Chair, when workers are struggling to take care of their families, we simply cannot afford any further delays when we're facing the worst economic crisis in a century. And our experience painfully, Comrade Chair, is that many times with many departments, um, in fact, all departments, it takes them years and years to draft legislation. So I think we really want to plead with government. Let's not have that situation now. Let's move with the necessary speed, but let's include all the issues that treasuries raised, that labor's raised. And I think members of parliament also raised to strengthen whatever, whichever bill we take, a member's bill or a treasury bill. Um, so let me stop there, Comrade Chair. I hope I've kept to the time frame, and thanks to members for giving us space. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Comrade Matthew. You have been uh, spared uh, three minutes for the next uh, presenter. Th thanks very much. Um, the next uh, presenter will be Association for Savings and Investment South Africa, ASISA, uh, 15 minutes. So it's now exactly quarter to 10. At uh, exactly 10 o'clock, uh, you have to, you should have uh, concluded. So we're trying to be strict with time, as I've indicated before, that uh, we've got a tight parliamentary schedule uh, uh, as for the past two weeks uh, uh, up to now. Uh, over to you, uh, Asisa. Asisa, can you open your mic? Can you beg please pardon. unmute? unmute? <clears throat> beg your pardon? Can you hear me now, Chair? Yeah, On yeah. we can hear you and we can see your, your screen. Thank you very much. I apologize for that. And thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity. Very briefly, in the interest of time, for those of you who may not that be that familiar with our organization, CESA, we are an industry association. Um, started in 2008, and we represent most of the long-term insurers and investment managers and uh, pension fund administrators. So we, the, our members' interest in this bill is, is that they are service providers to pension funds as administrators, as investment managers, as long-term insurers. Um, they provide services and investments to pension funds and um, therefore understand both the admin processes that the bill proposal will require. And also we, our members understand the human element because they interact regularly with fund members. Um, they are very sympathetic to the COVID-19 hardships that have been experienced by many employees 
and their households. There have been retrenchments, there have been salary cuts, there have been deaths, all resulting in, in lower household income. So they understand the financial pressure that South Africans are under, but they do not support the draft bill. Although the, the, the good intentions are appreciated and empathized with. The issue is that we don't believe that the proposal in the bill can have a good outcome. Could we have the next slide, please, Alan? Thank you. In our view, the proposal is likely to have very limited success, and that is predominantly because of the National Credit Act, the affordability criteria that have to be applied to loans. Just because a fund guarantee can be provided does not change the fact that the National Credit Act requirements are that that fund member who's applied for the loan still has to have the ability on a monthly basis to repay that loan. And uh, currently, the Pension Fund Act only allows retirement savings to, to issue a guarantee in respect to the loan for housing. And only in those funds that offer housing loans, only 2% of the members of those funds are, are currently using the facility. And that's, as the slides say, 1.4% of all members of occupational funds that are administered by our members. And why is this? From our members' experience, it's because most housing loan applications that are made by the fund members who want to use the fund to guarantee a housing loan, housing loan are rejected by the banks because of the national credit regulation rules. So housing loans themselves are not, are, are not broadly used and our members' systems and administration and capabilities are tailored accordingly. Could we have the next slide, please, Alan? So the question arises, well, okay, for those few who may qualify for these loans, um, is the proposal a good idea for them? And our members' view is no, it's not. The purpose of a retirement fund is to provide long-term benefits. Members, when they retire, death benefits for those who left behind, um, if a family member passes away, they are not intended, they're not structured, they're not geared for short-term savings or short-term guarantees. Housing loans have been permitted in the Pension Funds Act because providing a guarantee to secure a housing loan is basically in support of long-term financial security. But if you're going to support and encourage loans for short-term consumption, you're, you're doing the opposite. Could we have the next slide, please? In our members' view, getting into more debt is not a solution to members, to fund members who are already in financial difficulty. The, one of the big issues, too, is that the Pension Funds Act does not allow creditors to attach fund member savings in retirement funds to settle outstanding debts if they are in trouble with their creditors at the moment. The creditor cannot look to the pension fund to attach those assets to settle the debt. There are some very limited exceptions being in respect of housing loans where the fund has guaranteed the loan and where there have been uh, maintenance payment defaults. But if you're going to allow the savings of the fund to be used to guarantee any type of loan for any purpose, then logically, although the bill is defective in that it doesn't provide for this, it would have to be amended to, for this protection to fall away. And that will mean that retirement savings can be raided by creditors. And to our members' minds, this is, this is seriously problematic. Currently, in the funds that our members administer, 60% of those members have less than 50,000 rand saved in funds. And that means that a loan of 5,000 rand will reduce the savings by 10%, of 10,000 by 20%. A loan of up to 30,000 is going to reduce that 50,000 rand by 60%. It, 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 it just does not accord with the purpose of a retirement fund. And of course, when a member retires or should they pass away, that loan has to be repaid. And that means that already a very small pot of savings for retirement is going to be depleted. And that is very unfortunate consequences 
for the dependence on, the, on death. And certainly for those who do then um, default on the loan and, and have the capital of their retirement fund taken in order to satisfy the guarantee that the fund has had to give. So we really don't feel that this can be a good thing for these members and their dependents in any circumstances. Could we have the next slide, please? As has been mentioned um, by previous preventers, presenters, there are technical issues with the bill. Amending the section as proposed is not adequate. There are several other technical changes that would be needed to make it work. We have listed those in the written comments that we submitted. I won't go into them now. And of course, the Income Tax Act would also need to be amended to deal with the money that's leaving the fund um, if and when it's claimed by creditors. A significant amount of administrative time and resources would be taken to implement this. Um, this should not be, be underestimated. And uh, for very limited take up, one wonders whether the effort is being well spent um, when it is aimed at achieving what we feel is a, a retrogressive goal. Um, there will be additional costs involved when uh, everybody is trying to reduce costs in retirement savings. And one of the human issues is that the expectations that are created amongst, five mem uh, amongst fund members, when it is news, if this bill is accepted, that funds are allowed to lend up to 75% or whatever percentage it might be of your, cap of your capital or allowed to guarantee a loan of that amount, members will place boards of trustees in a difficult position. Should they do the popular thing and change the fund rules to allow these short-term loan guarantees or should they do the right thing and not allow it? And in our view, the time and the costs would be far better spent on a more sustainable long-term solution. We have the next slide, please. If we're wrong, and there is a much bigger uptake than expected, will this then change our view? And no, it wouldn't. To us, this would create even more problems. If there's large scale take, take, take up of the loan guarantees, then certainly retirement fund asset composition would have to be changed. Funds would definitely need to hold more liquid assets than they currently do to make provision for settling of the guarantees. This would compromise funds' ability to support longer term illiquid, pro illiquid pro projects such as infrastructure. Um, and whereas the country needs investment in long-term projects, retirement fund investments will have to cater for shorter term loan repayments. So loans being repaid out of fund savings on default, on leaving the fund because of resignation and death, it will result in large scale reduction in retirement savings, destitute pensioners and destitute dependents. We have the next slide, please. So in conclusion, we reiterate that we believe that the draft bill is well-intentioned. We understand where it's coming from. It's looking to assist those who've not lost their jobs, but are still employed, because it does need to be borne in mind that those who've lost their jobs have already been able to take all of their savings out of the fund. It's those who are in financial difficulty, although they are still employed. And yes, it may give some short-term relief for a small portion of members, but to our members, this will have a destructive impact. The legislative changes and implementation is going to take time. There's no quick fix in this. There's legislative amendment. There are systems changes that have to be undertaken in a fund by fund administrators. There is communication. There is education and training of staff. All of this takes time. And it obviously also takes costs, which we feel could be far better spent working on a longer term sustainable solution. And yes, this is not going to help the current crisis, but at least it will be in place for future emergencies. Could I have the final slide, please? So what solution then? And it was alluded to in the 2020 midterm budget, as well as in the 2021 budget speech, that part of the savings buildup in retirement funds 
could be made accessible for short-term needs at any stage, with the rest being permanently reserved for retirement, which must go hand in hand with preservation. And to CESA members, this would be a far more meaningful amendment to the system to make. A significant reason for the very low savings of most fund members in their funds is members taking all in cash when they leave their retirement funds when they change jobs. So they build up a little pot with one employer, take it all when they leave, build up a smaller, another small pot somewhere else. Far better if there is enforced preservation as jobs change, but to alleviate financial crises along the way, access to a small portion um, of the savings as you go along. Then at least there can be a consistent amount that can build up over the working years. And yes, those legislative changes will require a lot of work, um, but it'll be constructive work towards long-term financial security. It'll still allow limited access in emergencies, but ensuring reasonable retirement savings. Um, so it will not carry with it the risk that we feel that this bill um, poses. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Asisa, for your presentation. Uh, the next presentation will come from the Institute of Retirement Funds, Africa, IRFA, and Council of uh, Retirement Funds for South Africa. Uh, 15 minutes. Now is a minute to 10 o'clock. So you have up to 14 minutes past 10. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Nasli. I'm representing the Institute of Retirement Funds and Batseta the Council for Retirement Funds. Alan, can you put the slides up for us? Sorry, Mr. Chair, is my slides visible? Uh, yes, Nasli, you can go ahead. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, the submission, the presentation is a joint submission from Batsita and the Institute of Retirement Funds. These two organizations represent the retirement fund industry, the funds in the industry, as well as the trustees and the principal offices within the industry. While we recognize the financial hardships caused by the COVID-19 epidemic, we do not believe that this bill will achieve the desired outcome. We realize that governments across the world, as well as South Africa, has provided some relief towards people who are struggling financially, but we do recognize that this has not been sufficient to help people maintain the pre-pandemic consumption levels. We have looked at the, the bill that has been proposed or the amendments to the act that has been proposed, and we feel that we cannot support it. I will now go through the reasons for why we do not support the bill in its current form. There's a lack of detail provided in the, the bill, and we feel that the mechanisms for the provision of the loans has not been adequately laid out. Also, how has it been, not provide, been provided with a research in terms of the long-term impact on retirement outcomes? The information on implementation and the long-term impact will help us as stakeholders to consider the proposal in a more informed manner. As stated by my colleague's previous presentation, the purpose of retirement is specifically to provide retiring members and death benefits for dependents of deceased members. This is stated in both the Pension Funds Act. It is also again reiterated in the draft of the COFI bill which has just been issued recently, Mr. Chair. The housing loans which are provided for in section 19 of the Pension Funds Act are for long-term benefits. So retirement funds which are for long-term saving vehicles tie in with the long-term benefits of providing a home loan or the security needs of a member. The home loans, we believe, provide the long-term benefits, and that is why it was originally recognized and provided for in Section 19 of the Act. The loan for short-term consumption, we feel, does not accord with the same policy, and the risk that the longer-term financial consequences of leaving a member without a pension at the end of the day 
will outweigh the short-term benefits provided by providing these guarantees for the loans itself. National Treasury has stated categorically that it is looking at preservation of funds and that is one of its agendas that it is driving. We feel that this bill discourages preservation and stated policies to prevent leakage. And there are already measures in place to ensure that preservation takes place, such as the in-fund preservation, which was brought in with default regulations, as well as the recent T-Day annuitized, provenant fund annuitization, which was brought in in March this year. We believe that the, the efforts that this has gone to will actually be eroded by now allowing members access to their funds. As stated previously, saving levels in, in South Africa is, re, is very low. 61% of our pensioners can't make ends meet. 50% of our members are expected to retire with less than a 20% of replacement ratio. That's 20% of their salaries at the date of retirement. Also only 60% of members in employer funds have about six months salary or less at retirement. The bill also states, with the memorandum in the bill states that there's no impact to, to the state. However, we feel that this is not exactly 100% clear because state pensions ultimately will be impacted. Because if you are eroding your retirement savings through access to loans, eventually you will retire with less and your retirement outcomes will be less, which ultimately will result with greater reliance by retiring members on state old age pensions. Impact on financial markets, the pressure on retirement fund assets will be placed as members exit the fund or as members default on their loans, funds will be called up for this guarantee, which effectively means funds will be forced to sell units and have liquidity available to be able to pay these loans up immediately. The access for the criteria to these loans aren't very clearly stipulated, so there's no clear assessment criteria. How will one be assessed as to whether you are in financial difficulty or not? It also creates a liability for the boards of these funds if they are expected to create a discretion and to exercise a discretion in terms of who is and who is not in financial difficulty at any point in time. It will also be difficult to assess whether a loan is due to COVID-related distress or whether a member was actually in distress prior to the COVID or to any other emergency. It will place an additional monitoring burden not just on funds, but also on the regulators to ensure that when these guarantees are issued, that the correct criteria is being used to ensure that there is not an abuse or misuse of the funds. The impact on the administration systems and the administration costs, the administration burden that was will place on the administration over and above the trustees is that their systems would have to be readjusted again to make provision for these loans and also to make provision or payment of a guarantee call up in the event that a member defaults on the loan. Rules will be amended across the board and tax directives will be required in the event that the loan needs to be settled immediately. Both rule amendments, tax directives is definitely going to place pressure on both our regulator as well as on the revenue services as we will see an increase in responsibilities on both of these regulators. Managing the technical compliance aspects related to the surety value of 75% will be technically demanding and challenging because you'd have to weigh up the interest that's been accumulated on this loan. And if it is called up, you stand the risk that the investment growth may not have matched what the interest accumulation has been, which then means that members would be moving outside that maximum of 75% and could eventually leave a fund where the guarantee could actually be greater than what the member's asset value is in the fund as of the date of the call up. This will have the increased administration burdens and the governance costs that this places on the fund will ultimately be transferred to the member and effectively your member's costs will increase. Amendments will be required to the Income Tax Act. It's a partial withdrawal in effect where the settlement of the loan takes place, which means the tax application will be required. Also, if this bill applies to all retirement funds, including retirement annuities, it then would mean that a person who is, belongs to a retirement annuity could access their benefits prior to the age of 55 years old. This would require a tax income tax change immediately. Then as stated as well, Section 37A provides protection to retirement funds, but it is protected from creditors of members. And that the purpose thereof was to ensure that when a person retires, that creditors don't effectively eat into the retirement benefit. 
by allowing members and banks to access this money effectively, you're losing that protection and members' asset values in their pension funds will now be open to creditors to attack as and when they feel it's necessary. There was this was attempted in Australia, and while we recognize that Australia is not similar to South Africa and our economic and our conditions in South Africa is very different from Australia, cash payments were made to members last year out of the superannuation funds. Out of a sample of 13,000 members that was conducted, what was found that there was increased spending by members who had taken monies out of their funds. And it was not just to maintaining, to maintaining their spending levels pre-COVID period, but an actual increase in spending. It was found that purchased, purchases tripled on average in the fortnight after the money was actually deposited. In an analysis of how this money was used, it was found that money was used to pay debt. It was followed by gambling, by the supermarkets and other groceries, clothing stores, automotive fuel and service stations. Only 22% was actually found to have been used on essentials. What we have found, Mr. Chase, is that the 75% limit doesn't take into account if the security is called up that it is an all-inclusive amount because members could have existing home loans in place. They could also have attachment orders in terms of maintenance and in terms of divorce orders which becomes an administrative nightmare to try and maintain that the 75% is not breached through any of these loans, or is the 75% limit only allocated towards this specific um, guarantee that is being provided. The current retirement commutation threshold in respect of a pension fund is one third. So the 75% and maintaining it in the pension fund becomes extremely difficult. And a pension fund also, especially a DB fund, it becomes difficult as to how will one calculate what that 75% value is. With T-Day being implemented already in March 2021, that's the Provident Fund annuitization, we are seeing vested and non-vested benefits. The non-vested portion, then that 75% effectively, will also then come from that, which will again go against what Treasury is trying to put in place by the annuitization of Provident Funds. Any current housing loans and the amount of pension interest available if a divorce order was granted must be taken into consideration. Therefore, that 75% is already too high. If you take the loans, the interest into account, the divorce orders into account, and the tax that would be liable on those values, Mr. Chief. Then also there would need to be a relook at the COFI bill, which is currently in draft, because the definitions of the retirement funds in the COFI bill is very much aligned to the current definition in the Pension Funds Act which is the fact that it is, is a long-term savings requirement and it is there to provide for annuities and for death benefits for members on retirement and for beneficiaries when they die. The payment terms, but also needs to be expanded in the bill, is what is the term of the loan that would be required? What is the time period? What are the proposed interest rates that, that would be required? Will banks or the financial institutions be allowed to set these at leisure or will it be dictated to, from a central position so that it is applied across the board and so that the potential for abuse thereof is eradicated. Section 37D3 deals with the hierarchy of deductions. It also will need require clarification and further expansion because if there is limited funds available, we would need guidance in terms of which loan should be benefit over which other loan. So while tax may come first, do we pay this loan first, do we pay a home loan first, or do we pay the divorce or the maintenance? Uh, order first, Mr. Chair. So we also feel that the, the bill could also cause inequity in members in that the requirements of the NCA would also still need to apply from an affordability perspective. So our members may, may be there, it may be approved, however, may still not be able to access it because they still may not be able to pay the required repayments at the end of the day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks very much uh, for your presentation, uh, IRFA and the Council of Retirement Funds for South Africa, and uh, also saving uh, much of the time, almost uh, five minutes that uh, you have uh, donated to the next presenter. Uh, the next presenter, Saika. Um, 15 minutes. Saika, you are used to 
our way of doing things, you are almost here, every, almost every quarter. You are part of us. So Thank over you. to you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so you Thank have about uh, 15 minutes. Um, so use those 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Honourable Members. I'll be quite quick today. I think all the previous speakers have covered um, everything that we want to say, um, but I think it is important that we do uh, go over the concerns again and share some of the proposed recommendations should this bill go ahead or any other bill uh, of a similar format. So the table of what we're going to be discussing is just the acknowledgement of the concern, as the other, the other speakers have said, the treatment of the loan on default, and then the withdrawal of funds from uh, the tax implication side. So as, as all the other speakers have said, we acknowledge the concern you know, that COVID has brought in. It's a very difficult balancing act for, for government at this stage. I mean, if we just look at one of the United Nations University reports that was released in March this year, um, two in five South Africans has lost their main source of household income. And this is in urban areas, not even in rural areas. And if we have a look at um, you know, the, the situation in 2017, it was bad then, um, and it has just got ex ex excruciatingly worse in 2020 going into 2021. So we do acknowledge this, and, and it is concern. But we, we do note that the proposal will not affect all uh, employed or previously employed, but it will still impact. And, and I know, uh, Momo, you mentioned the, the number of funds that you want to reduce in terms of the 2017 pension funds um, uh, report. It said that there were 5,100 funds uh, with more than 11,000 fund members, 11 million, sorry, fund members. So the reality is that most people will never be able to catch up uh, the funds that they're going to be withdrawing if this goes ahead, um, as it's just too expensive and most already under such heavy debt burden. We just did a quick example that was um, reported previously. If you assume that you save um, you will save with 30 years to retirement um, and you cash in after the first 10 years, then your monthly amount needed to catch this up uh, to the same value of retirement is threefold. If you then uh, cash in after 20 years, the amount that you need to catch up, the amount that you withdrew is tenfold. And the reason being that you have a shorter time period um, to, to catch up this amount that you've taken out and the, the powerful effect of compounding interest. So um, the question is, you know, this is, as Kudasata said, it's the workers' money, um, but are South Africans financially astute and do they know what to do with the money that they've got specifically on withdrawal from, from the retirement funds? Well, if we look at the history, and as has been explained in the previous presentation, South Africa does not have a good history of savings. Um, as we know, less than 10% of, of South Africans actually do invest in, in savings for retirement and, and will have enough on retirement, and that's even less. But if you compare us to the other countries, um, if you look at the developing countries, you will see that South Africa is really failing dismally in, in this regard. Um, but even if you compare us to countries such as India, there they're sitting at, uh, at about 10% of household savings. Um, whereas we're sitting below at this stage, this was um, 0. Point something percent. I know Momo, I think you said that's now gone up to 2%, which is good news. But the concern is not only do we not save, but we spend more than we actually earning. So if you look at our household debt to disposable income in South Africa at the end of December last year, we were sitting at 77%, meaning that of the gross income that a household gets in, 77% of that goes to debt. So what, what is our concern here? Well, in a perfect world, yes, our suggestion here would be that the people should have access to the funds. They should be able to, should be financially astute to manage their own affairs. Um, and not have government involvement in this. But as, as history can, as you can see, we are not good savers and we do not seem to be managing our affairs properly. So we need to find a balancing act between the self-sufficiency of getting our money and um, compelled retirement investment. Now, the funds exited will not, as I've showed in that previous example, be easily replaced, if at all possible. Um, so we're deferring the problem now to a later stage. And at 40, I think it's easier to try and recover these funds. But at 65, it's going to be virtually impossible to try and recover from this withdrawal of the funds. One thing that also the bill didn't go into a lot of detail is the treatment on loan default. So what happens when the individual can no longer uh, repay this loan and the defaults and the bank comes and takes that money back? Now, we know that this bill extends this loan to beyond immovable property. The current act as it stands allows for a housing loan to be accessed uh, through the security. This, this bill opens it up, as all the other speakers said, to anything. So it's, it's willy-nilly that people can go and access their funds at this stage. 
And as we see, you know, South Africans are not good at managing the funds. So it has to um, be narrowed down and we'll look at suggestions of that just now. The other thing that it doesn't go into a lot of detail is the procedure on default. So it's not clear whether or not, you know, the, the fund gets direct access. Um, it has to be withdrawn and the loan repaid immediately because that's the next thing is the timing of this default. You know, does this have to be paid immediately on default? So um, it withdraws straight away. Or is the, the, the person providing this loan, has it got a right to the um, access to this pension fund only when the fund membership terminates? So that's also not very clear and needs to be considered in whichever version of this bill or a new bill that comes out is, is how does it work? And is it a loan on a loan? So does the pension fund then provide the you know, funding to repay the loan and then the member now owns the fund, this money? So it's a, a loan to the fund and not to the lender. Um, so all those kind of things need a little bit more clarity to in the, the bill. And as most commentators and the next thing I'll be discussing is, you know, there is a tax implication. There is a withdrawal benefit that takes place if the cash is actually taken out. So if it's not the second scenario that I mentioned, where it's a loan on loan. So the pension fund basically assumes this, this loan um, that the creditor had to the bank. So our submission here is that, as with most commentators, I've said, this cannot be used in all circumstances. We've got to limit the circumstances in which these loans are provided. You've got to somehow give proof of you've been retrenched, that you have severe financial hardship, not that you can't pay your car, your TV, et cetera. Um, and so we have two, two approaches, and, and Treasury can decide to go very broad on this or very narrow. So the broad approach is, is to you know, open it up to, to real financial hardship. The narrow approach is to say, well, let's limit this again as the initial a bill or the initial act has got it to immovable property, but not only allowed to access a home loan, but to keep your property at this stage. Because a lot of people now do have homes, but they cannot afford to carry on paying for these home, home loans. Um, and, and just the question that was raised is how many people actually have access to, to homes? Um, an interesting 2013, and obviously the stats would have changed now um, if it's updated, we couldn't get access to that, is that there are about 6.1 million syllable homes uh, then, um, and that's excluding public housing and, and tribal homes, and there were about 4, point, 4 million RDP homes. So if you look at this, roughly about 11 million people in funds and 11 people with, with syllable homes, um, we're not sure, obviously, what percentage of those people that have homes also invest in, in these funds, but it, it does have some sort of correlation. So we need also clarity on how the lender will exercise this repayment. So again, will there be a compelled order of realization? So do you first go after the TV or the cars, or can they immediately come after this retirement plan? And this is very important to put, not only to, to disincentivize people from actually taking out the retirement plans, but it's also to try and prevent people providing these loans because this is really an easy, easy target. So you can, no problem giving these loans and there's lots of loan sharks out there, but it, they're happy to take these kind of things on because they know that their repayment is guaranteed. On the withdrawals of funds, as the previous commentators have also mentioned, um, there are tax implications. So we said the loan guarantee is limited to 75% of the value of the fund. Um, now, the execution against this guarantee T obviously will trigger with withdrawal, and there are tax implications for this withdrawal. So the question is, with these tax implications, will the remaining 25% have to be uh, used to fund this tax? Because bearing in mind that the people actually applying for this are already under financial hardship, so how and they can't repay the loan, how are they going to actually pay the tax on this uh, pension fund that they have to that they have now uh, withdrawn? And then will the tax be pre or post pay? So if it's prepaid, so again, will this 25%, if it is taken out the 25%, will it be sufficient uh, to, other, to cover the tax? Otherwise, yeah, um, the tax is going to be problematic. We haven't gone into what could start to say with no tax. But again, the bill has to consider all of this um, before it, it is approved. But I think, yeah, we, we agree, I think with most of the sentiments um, expressed by the other commentators, and I think a lot of changes need to happen before this has to, uh, before this can be approved in the current format. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Saika, for your presentation and very, being straight to the point. Um, thanks. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, uh, yeah, the presentations coming from uh, stakeholders. It is time now for engagement by committee members. Um, it's in the platform, of course, uh, 
Dr. George is here. Alan and Tebu, I can only see Dr. George, who else has raised their hand. Uh, there's uh, Dr. George and Hill Lewis. Honorable Hill Lewis. Um, okay, Let, let's start with uh, Dr. George. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, with your indulgence, I do want to respond to each one but I am brief, so I won't take up a significant amount of time. Um, to the Treasury, thank you for your um, overview of retirement reform. One of the objectives of my bill is to ensure this remains at the forefront of our agenda, um, and that objective is met. The key is that, that progress must be made. NEDLAC is moving very slowly, and that process needs pressure for progress to be made. I do think that the Treasury has taken a possibly extreme view of the behavior of members. The bill is very easy to understand. The fund trustees would decide if the fund would make a loan facility available. The members would remain subject to the National Credit Act and be able to procure a loan or not. Given that the industry has evolved from defined benefits to defined contributions where the risk passed to members and then individual member choice was introduced, um, the concept of members taking the risk and making investment decisions is well established. A further evolution to members deciding how best to leverage their own money, for example, in the form of a loan, is certainly not an impossible development and should form part of a wider reform. Um, then to Kasatu, thank you for your input and your insights. Um, we are on the same side on this issue because our focus is on the members and we are sensitive to the reality that members are facing and urgent need for relief and responses needed. The fact is that members do have an asset that can be leveraged and there is an opportunity for creative solutions to a complex problem um, if there is sufficient will to do so. I completely agree that this matter cannot be dragged out and I am open for further changes to be made to the bill, um, given that it is currently on the table and there is a real issue that needs to be addressed. Um, to Assisa, uh, thank you. Yes, the bill will um, have limited success, um, but it will have some success. And that is the crucial point. I do get the technical issues regarding default. We can't make the assumption though that everybody will default. I am pleased that you have clearly applied your mind. My proposal does have a potentially significant impact and that was the intention of proposing it. It was in fact to shake up and accelerate the debate and the reform process, which it has done and I am pleased at that outcome. I do like your alternative proposal and the fact that you have made your position clear. Thank you for that. Into BATSITA, the Institute of Retirement Funds. And thank you for your detail on the difficulties in administration. They these will be useful to bear in mind when the loan component is included in the overall retirement package. I proposed 75% because um, there would be, that would be an upper ceiling and it would be unlikely that a fund would set it, um, the facility at that upper ceiling. Um, the questions you raised will be very useful to bear in mind in the design of the loan component of a reform facility. Um, then for Osaika, th Saika, thank you for your analysis. There will be no erosion given that the loan is repaid I do, however, understand your concern on erosion in the event of default and the need to clarify the default process and the tax implications. So those are my inputs to everybody. I am grateful for them. Thank you very much. As I mentioned earlier on previously, is that my bill is very simple to understand. So I'm pleased that it isn't completely misunderstood. I think that there is a, always an argument that if you want to straw man an argument, you take an extreme view and then you argue from there, i.e. that everybody will default. No, they will not. That is a fact. 
um, but I do understand the, the issues that are raised. I also understand this is a complex matter and that it isn't, um, it isn't um, going to be beneficial if we make um, moves that are not sensible. But certainly I do think we're moving in the right direction. I am grateful for the in inputs and, and thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. George. Uh, uh, Honorable Lewis, over to you, then uh, Honorable Abram. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to Dr. George for, uh, for the bill, the, the work that went into the bill, uh, and for his response comments now. Uh, I really do understand and support the intention of the bill. I'm sure that this has been a a common experience uh, by many colleagues in this committee, but I, I clearly remember a, a, a very emotional phone call from, from someone during lockdown last year who was crying on the phone saying that, you know, they have been furloughed, their salary has been reduced to nearly nothing, they cannot put food on the table, they don't think that they can keep their house and they're sitting with uh, a very sizable chunk of savings in their retirement fund, but have no way of accessing it, accessing it at this time of real emergency. And I think that there were thousands of South Africans in that position. And uh, there might still be many who are still in that position, particularly in the tourism and, and travel industry. And I think that we have a responsibility to try and do something to help them. And, and it's, it's very, uh, it should be applauded that Dr. George has, has gone out of his way to write this bill to try in some way help those people. And I, I'm very pleased that it has the support from across the aisle uh, because I think that this is an experience. The phone call that I had from that gentleman is something that all of us have experienced over the last year. So we, we must find a way to try and help those people, even if, if some of the, 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 the very sensible proposals that other speakers have made uh, are adopted and, and that this bill is amended. I think that we must find a way to try and help those people and soon. And so the, the only point of difference that I'd like to raise with, with uh, our friend from Kosatu is to say, I do not think that we should wait for months for, for any other bill. We have a bill before us, we can amend it uh, as we see fit. We have some credible proposals, sensible proposals from, from ASISA and others on the table for how we can give people partial access to relieve their time of crisis right now. And uh, we should move forward on that basis. If we wait for government, uh, we could be waiting many, many months, if not longer. And uh, there are lots of people in this economy who just don't have many, many months. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Honorable Lewis, for your input. Honorable Abraham, over to you. No, oh, okay, Chair. Sorry for that. Yeah, thank okay. you so much. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, I think we must also applaud uh, the Honorable Member, uh, Honorable George, for the initiative. But I also want us to be a bit balanced in terms of the areas that have been, uh, <clears throat> sorry, that, that have been picked up as areas of improvement. And I think in that regard, we need to be able to say to, to, to Honorable George, um, is he in a position to take the amendments as presented and tweak um, is, 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 is a bill in that regard and whether as uh, Momo, Momo from National Treasury has indicated, 
uh, whether the, the points that he raised are not points that can be used as, as, as kind of amendments to the bill rather than outright a dismissal of the bill. I'm also listening to the inputs of the stakeholders from COSATU to the last one, that there is a relative support of the bill. And based on that and what the honorable member has also added in his last remarks, is there a possibility that this bill can be modified in conjunction, of course, with the honorable member so that we do not lose the essence of what it wants to achieve, especially it is, if it is for the benefit of the majority of the people of our country so that we, 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 we make use of it. But if there are areas that need some modification, we go ahead and do that. I think, Chair, basically, I'm asking a question to the Honorable Member George as to whether he would, he, he, that would be workable for him. And I'm also asking a question to National Treasury as to whether there is kind of any amendment that they can add to the bill that will make it stand, even though uh, there are areas of concern, just getting rid of the areas of concern, addressing them in a particular way and going ahead with the bill, if that's possible. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Honorable Abraham. Um... So you are putting the question to Dr. George and Treasure. Uh, over to you, Dr. George. Then, uh, uh, Chair, Chair, maybe Mr. before Dr. George comes in. Oh, honorable. Oh. Let, let, let me apologize. I'm struggling with my gadget here. Uh, oh, I, I, I certainly concur. Honorable. With, honorable. Thank you very much. I certainly concur with the uh, with the with the whip. Uh, uh, about the, the the approach and the uh, you know the significance of uh, uh, some uh, meeting of minds uh, with respect to uh, the the bill, especially because uh, it stands to uh, benefit uh, the majority of South African, many of whom are the poorest of the poor black and female. Uh, uh, and so uh, I, I would want Treasury to specifically speak to the three aspects uh, that uh, have cropped up in the discussion. Uh, the, the fact that they feel that there has been uh, a inadequate focus on the National Credit Act and indebtedness. Uh, to what extent? Uh, can we uh, accommodate some of these concerns? The, the second one uh, is that uh, they feel that guarantees uh, will create substantial contingencies, challenges uh, for the pension fund. Um, how, how do we mitigate uh, against these uh, contingency challenges? The, the third one is on the tax implications. And I think if Treasury can uh, somewhat uh, provide a broad uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, intervention on some of these issues and say, uh, this is how uh, we can, you know, create a balance uh, in the in the in the draft bill, and and this is how we can uh, intensify and strengthen it uh, to be uh, to address all the uh, issues and challenges which have uh, been raised. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Honorable Mrolo. Uh, Honorable uh, Dr. George, then uh, Treasure. Thank you, Chairperson, and thanks very much, colleagues. Yes, absolutely. Um, we, um, as members of Parliament, we are, our job is basically to consider the difficulties that are faced by, by our people 
and find better ways to do things. So yes, Honorable Abrams, absolutely, I am very much keen and very much um, uh, willing and able to engage regarding changes that would, would be, need to be made to the bill to make it um, into the product that we would like to see. Um, so yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. And I'm very much willing to work as hard as necessary to get that done. Thanks, Chair. Treasury, Comrade Momo and your team. Uh, yes, Chair, no thanks. Chair, um, you know, the message that we are putting forward is, is that there's no benefit at all. And frankly, um, uh, the, the problem is that it's totally contradictory. We, you know, in most instances in the world, people don't save for their retirement. If I think of myself, Chair, if uh, being, and, and, and yes, it's a collective bargaining agreement and so on, but if my employer was not deducting every month for the last few decades that I'm working at the treasury, I would not have a retirement fund today. And I don't count as the poor. So most of us will not save. And that's why we use quite a lot of behavioral theory. We have a lot of uh, interactions internationally. And these mechanisms together with the tax mechanisms are quite important to get people to save. And in South Africa, the problem is perhaps worse than other countries that we don't save. And from a macro perspective, uh, I mean, the only people who save, by the way, are richer households. Now there's an objective reality to that, that obviously you have more money, you're able to save, but the tax deduction that comes in, uh, a lot, lot of rich households, aside from the pension, save on retirement annuities, true retirement annuities. And, if, and in fact, once they get to the limit, I think the limit's 350,000, they then use the money and they save in different ways. Um, uh, um, so, but getting those funds into the contractual or the, the pensions fund space is there for the long term, it has huge benefits for the country. Once you talk withdrawal, it goes directly against that objective. So unless we don't want the objective of saving from a macro perspective and for the individual's perspective that you're pushing the person to save. I mean, I, I, I save, but I also have huge debts, okay? Like whether it's my, the bond on my house, for example, okay? And most of us who aren't ultra rich are going to be uh, in that position that, that we still have debt on our house and so on. And maybe from a net perspective, you may not even be, be uh, solvent in that sense. But the fact that you're earning an income and you're forced to put aside, the, 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 the magic of pension funds is that if you save, I think the point that Saika was making, if you save over 30, 40 years through compound interest and, and growth in the markets, you hope it becomes a massive amount. The, the more you, 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 you withdraw, you have less time to save. So it works against that objective. So in most jurisdictions, you allow zero withdrawal. And I think that we should not dismiss the fact that you should have zero prospect for withdrawing. Yes, a lot of households are stressed. But this, I think what we're trying to show is not the solution to how you can get more money. If you look at the point that was made, I think it was in a CISA slide, that over 60% of members have less than 50,000 rands. And yes, what can you do with 50,000 rands? But the point is that this mechanism at least gets further households to save. And if you we were to close the withdrawal, the, the preservation, a uh, uh, gap that you have when people resign, they take away their funds. It means that uh, uh, you'll at least increase that amount. And I'll give you an example, Chen. I may not have the right percentages, so I'm just gonna use an example. 
after GPF, one of the biggest funds we have is the Metalwork and Engineering Pension and Provident Funds. You'll find that typically 100%, sorry, 90% of the members are in the Provident Fund, 10% in the Pension Fund. But you'll then find that the value of the asset, the 10% have 90% of the value and the 90% have 10% of the value. And that's because people have changed jobs often and, uh, and, and cashed up. Obviously, it may be that higher income people all, also have more money and, and they keep their money there and so on. So I understand there's objective factors behind that as well. But the reality is how do you build asset wealth for households, for poor households? Uh, and the majority are black. I don't have to tell you that, Chair, or to any honorable member. And the reason why black workers went to provident funds was because of the struggles in the 1980s that uh, uh, black workers did not have any retirement provision. And by the way, Chair, that's the reason why even when many of those mine workers who through the hard-won struggles uh, of uh, their unions in those days, got provident funds, didn't even know they had provident funds, and you have uh, a, a, a large amount of money that was not claimed, and which is gonna be very hard to find those people in the 80s and 90s who saved, because black people at that time, as you know, the system didn't even give them ID numbers. They don't, employees didn't even record their, their, their surnames. It might be John from Shaft Three, okay? That's all. And the person could be from Malawi, could be from Mozambique. So I'm, I'm just trying to give those difficulties. So Chair, the Treasury, and, and, and that's why when we've looked at withdrawals, we're not saying no, but to find a solution. And that's only taken up in a very small number of cases. You don't want to have a tool that's used by most of the members, then they won't have savings. It it's really requires hard technical work. And this bill cannot be salvaged. It actually doesn't understand, uh, raise, uh, look at the hard questions. And I think Honorable George has said, it's just to stir. And, and I like the fact that he stirred. And I would love to come and talk to you in more detail on retirement reform, because these are big issues from a macro perspective and from a member perspective. And I did that in, 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 in in, in a very short amount of time. So the question is still that we want people to preserve and let's close that uh, loophole that there, that there is in the system. So for that reason, we feel that the bill should, it, it would be great if it's withdrawn now that Honorable George has achieved his objective of getting us to talk about it and, and, and all that it needs to be, well, we hope rejected because we think the technical work to fix it up requires a lot of work and bear in mind that it involves a money bill, which only the Minister of Finance in any case can table. So, to, and, and that work is being done with NADLAC. We're quite happy to open up the process to others as well, uh, to, to try and find a way of dealing with it. But let's not forget the overall objective of, of, of saying, so Chair, to conclude, what we're saying is, we would question that the withdrawal option even solves a problem of those households that have extreme difficulty. Yes, we all get calls. And whatever rule you have, Chair, people are going to fall the other side of the rule and then lobby and beg and, and cry. And, 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 and we feel for that. But if we're just going to then break the rule because obviously of real hardship in a few households, we will not have a savings. Uh, we will not have South further South African saving. They will not be building up their asset wealth. And when they retire, aside from getting their government pension, they will actually be very vulnerable. As it is chair, when they retire, the vultures surround them. And that's why we push that people annuitize and not just take their money and then use it up and then actually um, uh, really suffer in their later years when they're not able to work. So we would plead, Chair, to uh, the, the Honorable George who has sponsored the bill, if, since he's achieved his objective to get us talking, that uh, uh, just given the complexity of the issues and what's involved, it, we, we need to develop a framework that will work for South Africa, 
before we actually write the bill. The writing the bill is the easy part. Uh, and it's not because there's been a delay, but because the issues are complex and not, let's not potentially decimate our savings industry. And Chair, I'm not using these words lightly. It, it will happen. Uh, people will rush to the door to take their money out um, uh, uh, or to withdraw because we've pushed them. And that's why we will not, by the way, Chair, want to uh, uh, also relax the burden on taxation because, you know, what the state, this is a pact with the devil of the state that thou shalt annuitize and preserve if thou takes the tax deduction when you're contributing and the fact that there's no taxation on your growth. We have very generous tax provisions to get you to save. Withdrawal will undermine that objective. That doesn't mean we are saying zero percent withdrawal. We are saying limited and very, very limited and partial withdrawals, but we have to be very strict and developing that is going to be difficult. So Chair, we really don't see how you can improve this bill. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Comrade Momo. I see Dr. George is raising his hand. Uh, Dr. George, uh, so that we can move to that next item. Right, thanks very much, um, Chair. Um, I agree with Treasury, it is a complex matter, but certainly no, the primary objective of my putting my bill onto the table was not to stir the debate. Yes, that was one of the objectives and that certainly has been met. And that was to make sure that it remains on the table and that we make some progress. But the primary objective was to find a practical solution. Now, I know it's not simple, and I've never said it was a silver bullet, but what we have agreed, certainly, um, we certainly agreed that with Kosatu, we've certainly agreed that with, with other of my colleagues um, across the aisle, is that we do have a real problem and that progress has not been sufficient. I understand the subject, I really do, because my doctoral thesis was actually on conversions from defined benefits to defined contributions. And I have a real doctorate, so I am knowledgeable on the subject. So um, I understand it's not simple, but I do think that with all due respect, I think that the treasury is being insensitive to the plight of the people. I am not saying throw open the doors and have no pension provision, et cetera. But we must understand the complexities of our country and the history of our country. We are not like other countries and therefore we need to find a solution that works for us. I understand there's lots and lots of vested interest. Um, we have strong lobbies, et cetera, but certainly our job as members of parliament is to make sure that we hear the people as we have said, we hear them all the time as my, 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 my colleague, Honorable Hill Lewis has said, and others, that there is a real problem and we need to find a real solution. And the solution is not, well, let's wait for what? Let's wait for next year, maybe. Let's wait for how long are we gonna wait? So um, I don't think that's an answer. I do not accept that it's an answer to the question that we have an issue, we need to grapple with it. Yes, it's difficult and yes, it's complicated but we have sufficient brain power to actually find a solution. There's no doubt about it. The process at NEDLAC we know is very slow. It even gets bogged down. I'm not quite sure why. I mean, there's lots of lobbying going on, I know. So, so as I said before, the intention was not primarily to just make a stir. Obviously that is my job too, as a member of parliament, but to move forward towards a solution. And I think that if the committee's view is that we need to move forward towards a solution, then no, I'm not prepared to withdraw my bill. And I think that if we can find a sensible mechanism, even if it's a short term step in the right direction, then we need to find it. Because we know that we're heading now for how many years since the conversions from defined benefits to defined contributions started in the 80s, how long this is going on for, and yes, we're going slow and gentle progress, but 
I do think that sometimes you need to break a few shells of a few eggs to get somewhere. That is what South Africa does very well. And I think this is one of those times that we need to do it. And I'm committed to work as hard as possible and to apply as much technical expertise as I have and other people do to get somewhere on this. But ignoring it and saying, oh, well, yes, we understand that people are in a really difficult situation, even though they have an asset that may well be leveraged. No, well, so, sorry for you. I think that's very insensitive. And I don't think that that's acceptable. As a representative of people, I would certainly not find that acceptable. That is my position, Chair, um, but I do understand the complexities. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. George. Uh, the next item, responses, Alan, uh, eight. Do we mean responses by stakeholders or we meant honorable members? Uh, that's normally for honorable and um, excuse me, uh, for members, but uh, because it's a members bill, he's answered so, um, I'm not sure if there's maybe a stakeholder or two that's got a uh, response uh, for anything that's been directed at them. Okay. Uh, we encourage a participatory democracy whereby the public should have a direct access to parliament like you do now so uh, so that you don't feel that uh, you only made a presentation you were not allowed to come back uh, if there are stakeholders who want to make uh, inputs or response i can give you uh, two minutes um, to do so Uh, for now, Chair, we've got a hand, Matthew Parks, Kasatu. Okay. Uh, Comrade Matthew, uh, over to you. Okay. No, no, thanks um, very much, Chair. Yeah, thanks to, to members and to colleagues and to Treasury. Um, I mean, I think just maybe kind of three points. Um, I think, Chair's members have said that, you know, workers are facing huge challenges um, during this pandemic, and they all face challenges going forward. And there are funds available to assist these workers so they don't have to be dependent upon miracles or relief from the UIF, which is very limited. And I think we want to really find a way, Chair, that doesn't force members who, threat, who are at risk of losing their homes, for example, from resigning from working cash at the whole pension fund, because that is the worst situation that none of us would want. I mean, I think, Chair, also it's important to remember, these are workers' funds. They've saved for it. Um, and I think we would not want a situation where industry for the issue of profit motives of, which is obviously their job, simply saying we have a veto right as industry, as business, we're not going to allow help for these workers. We'll provide crocodile tears, we'll give some words of sympathy, but we're not gonna come with solutions. I think Chair, the bill is an attempt to provide a solution. Uh, we are glad that Treasury agrees that we need to provide a solution to help these workers. So I think we need to move from simply saying, no, we can't do something to say, what can be done? And Chair, we don't mind, I mean, whether it's in this private member's bill or a treasury bill, that's administrative. The point is, let's come with a bill, either one, let's provide the necessary protections, criteria, limitations, et cetera, but let's do it this year. Um, because our experience, to be honest, Commissioner Chair, is that government across the board takes about five years to go from drafting a bill to it becoming a reality on the ground. Um, and workers simply don't have the luxury of time. Um, Chair, I mean, we've been raising as Cosa to this issue since I think May last year, the supplementary budget hearings when Dr. George first drafted the bill. And we thought it was a positive response to addressing real pain that workers are experiencing on the ground. And there's ample examples, Chair. If you look at Danelle, workers there are lucky to get 10% of the salary, yet they've got pensions available, but they can't access them. Um, so we're happy to engage and we think we can find consensus because if we listen to most of the points, be it from Treasury, be it from members of the Parliament across the political aisle, from Labour. Um, we think there is broad consensus about the objective of providing relief, the needing to do so quickly, but it's just for us to show the necessary will, all of us, to get it done this year. And um, we just can't delay this issue. And um, we have to help these workers in a reasonable win-win solution. Um, Chair, the benefits of a, of a private member's bill, why we were attracted to it is that 
it's much faster than a government bill. Private members' bill is already at Parliament. Yes, it needs to be amended to include the issues that Treasury and other colleagues, and including us, have raised to strengthen it, to avoid a unintended consequences of, of depleting the pension funds. But it's there, and we think we have that will, we can address it. Um, the one difficulty with government bills is that of the process you must go through, we understand why you need those processes, but it's the departmental internal consult consultations, it's about taking to the to, 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 to the CS, public comments, to NEDLAC, to the DG cluster, the cabinet subcommittee, the cabinet, parliament, and those things take years. Um, we would want to take Treasury at face value when they said they can draft a bill this year. And again, Chair, we don't mind whether we use this bill or the Treasury bill, but let's come with the proposals. Or maybe if it means having a smaller working group across the aisle, let's find the solution quickly, Chair. Um, but I think, Chair, our fear is that we, we, we first raised this thing as Kosaja in May last year. It's May now, um, and we've not moved significantly forward. So I don't know if all those answers come at Chair, but we're willing to give space for engagement with government and industry. We, we think we can find consensus at this will. We can come with other, other amendments to this existing bill or, or the treasury bill, whichever, but we need to do so in the next few months. We can't afford to kick this can down the road forever, Chair not if we are serious about providing relief to those who are really destitute and have suffered for no fault of their own. And the, you know, like Honorable Hill Lewis is saying, we've also received floods of calls from workers across the board um, who have lost wages and are desperate. They don't want to resign from the job. They hope that job can be saved. We've received even calls from workers who receive their salaries, but because their wife has lost her job, they need to give some relief. Um, and these are painful things. And we don't think that industry should simply just dismiss it and, um, and lecture workers as if they are irresponsible, naughty children who need to be taught a lesson. We need to find practical solutions and we need to do so quickly, Chair. But yeah, thanks to, to, to members and for giving us space to speak. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, uh, Comrade Matthew. Uh, Sharon, then uh, there is somebody, Alan, there's a hand. Uh, Rising the uh, yes, chair. That's a uh, rose uh, light body sheet from a CISA. Oh, okay, okay. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you, chair. Um, yes, I, I can't agree more with with Kusatu. Um, um, and also just to uh, applaud uh, honorable um, uh, Dennis for bringing this, dear and George, sorry, for, for bringing this bill. I, I think we we cannot waste more time. Um, it is a real problem, as he put it, and we need to find a practical solution. And I think a lot of the commentators did mention a few areas where, you know, where the, we've highlighted the areas and it's now just sitting down, getting together um, as the industry, as Treasury, SARS, everybody all on board, take this process, it's been started, let's carry on the process. It needs urgent intervention, waiting till next year. I think the people are dying now that they, they, they don't have the option to, to wait, but we do need to find a workable solution. So I, I agree with Treasury, you know, it, it's not a simple matter. It's stuff, uh, it really is going to require a lot of hard work from all parties concerned. Um, but I think there is consensus across the board that, that there has to be some sort of solution. So it's just working out what is that solution that will be to the best of the benefit of the people and the country. Um, and, and a work plan, a work group needs to be set up. Time, time, limit, time frames need to be put in place and, and it has to happen as soon as possible. It's in process already. I, I don't see why we cannot carry on this process. You know, another bill is also fine, but if it's going to take longer, um, I, I just can't see why we can't add on to this, fix it to make it work. Um, but agree 100%, we, we need to, to speed this up, come to a workable solution, work all together um, to, to, to help the individuals that are currently in need, um, but not put them um, and the country at risk. And, and it's going to be a difficult job, um, but, but it seems like everybody involved is willing to, to sit around the table and to discuss how we do this. So... I think that's the way forward. Let's, let's get together, work together to find the solution that everybody will be amenable to. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Sharon. Alan, how does it come that uh, Sharon is the co-host of uh, this platform? Uh, Chair, I made a co-host uh, when she um, put up a slide. Okay, but now she's not putting up the slides. She's still remaining a cause. 
Yeah, no, I just okay. forgot to uncohost. I've just done that. Okay. Uh, Asisa, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair, Honorable Chair. Um, I would just like to make the point that these are not crocodile tears and that we are crying when we say as industry that yes, we do understand and we empathize with the hardships that COVID has brought about on many, many pension fund members and others in this country. It's difficult when there seems to be a view that whatever industry says is, is comes from vested interests, but I can assure you that our members too and their staff feel very, very empathetic for those members of the funds who are effectively their clients who are in difficulty. So I would just like to assure you that this does come from a position of sincerity. And when we caution and say, this thing needs to be dealt with very, very carefully, it is because we care about those members and we want an outcome that's gonna be sustainable because after this emergency, there will be other emergencies. COVID is not the only emergency that has come along. It is a severe one, certainly, but there are others in life. And there are other instances when members ask, please, can they have access to their pension fund savings? And our member staff have to say no. So we feel that the time, because there seems to be an impression that this is a quick fix, that these loans will just be on the table, the loan guarantees within a few months. That is just not the reality of how things work. First, the legislation has to be effectively drafted with all of the various changes that will be essential for it to work. Rule changes will have to be made, amended, registered, and one should not underestimate the time it takes for administrative systems to be programmed and changed and for staff to be properly trained for communications to go out there to avoid misunderstandings and mistakes. That takes a significant amount of time. And our sense is rather than spending that time, effort and cost on something that is ultimately not going to have a good long-term outcome, rather spend the time, effort and cost on something that is going to have long-term sustainable outcomes. Whether you have a pocket in a fund that is available for emergencies, whatever those emergencies in the future might be, but at the same time, ensuring preservation on job changes so that building up alongside an accessible pocket, you have got a reasonable amount of retirement savings from the minute somebody starts becoming a member of a pension fund. And for us, that is something that will stand South Africans in good stead and is a far better, it would, it would be far better to spend effort on a solution along those lines, which has been alluded to by National Treasury, than on something that is assumed to be a quick fix and it's going to damage retirement fund savings and structures in South Africa. Thank you. Um, thanks. We'll have to move. Uh, Dr. George, I've given you enough time to respond earlier on. So I think we have to- A two finger chair, like 30 seconds. Okay. Um, yes, I just wanted to say to, to, um, the, to Asisa, I think we're all agreed there, that we all agreed that what we have now is not the best solution and that we can actually find a better one. So, you talk about the time and effort that we need to apply. Well, then let's do it. Let's do it now. Let's set a deadline and let's get it done because the, the, the process is alive and now is the time. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. George. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, the public at large. There are also those who made uh, written submissions that we are going to consider in compiling the report, uh, like uh, uh, Basa and uh, Fedusa. Uh, there might be others who might have done so. Uh, so thanks very much those of you who made uh, both uh, written and oral uh, submissions. 
We are going to study all the submissions as the committee, uh, look at the scientific uh, evidence before us, and also we'll look at the other experiences that we have. We have got a case, uh, uh, Momo, if you remember, that uh, we have been resolved up to now. Uh, the former vendor pension fund where public servants uh, withdrew money uh, or a portion of money uh, from their pension in the uh, early 90s uh, is still a matter between treasury and those uh, public servants or former public servants. It even uh, was the, the former public servants even took the case to the public protector. So it's a case in point that I will also make a reference to. And the issue raised by Treasury as to this bill that is um, uh, tabled by Honorable Dr. George, how does it impact on uh, the money bill? So we'll have to look at all those issues raised by uh, uh, the stakeholders uh, and issues raised by Treasury and weigh the evidence. And then uh, also our team from parliament will have to assist us in conducting research so that whatever report that we compile and uh, present before the National Assembly uh, should be scientific. Um, uh, uh, so thanks very much. Uh, the process will be taken to the next step to committee then uh, uh, National Assembly. Uh, uh, unless there are announcements from the side of the support team, they will go and Allen before we close. Are there announcements? Uh, no, Chair, uh, just the meetings next week. Yes, from me, sir. Uh, Chair, just the meetings next week on Tuesday. Uh, it's the Fiscal Responsibility Bill. Um, that's uh, Mr. Hill Lewis's bill. That's on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, uh, National Treasury will respond to yesterday's submissions on the Financial Sector Laws Amendment Bill. Okay. Okay, those are the announcements. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Uh, thanks very much, colleagues, until we meet again next week.